right. Hello, everyone. It's 11 a.m. and I'm happy to welcome you to our webinar CO2 reduction by plastics recycling. My name is Norbert Niesner. I'm a global innovation director at India Star Illusion Group and uh, hope to provide an interesting talk um, to you today. So let me start um, with the first slide. Um, you might see this uh, slide deck is composed of two parts, uh, two types of slides. One is uh, from our book. It's an excerpt from our book, Recycling of Plastics, recently uh, published at Hansa Munich. And the other ones are corporate slides, both circle around the topic uh, recycling and CO2 reduction, right? Okay. Um, I mean, I think uh, it's uh, needless to say to you that uh, compared to every other engineered material in the world, plastics have the highest growth rate due to their unique properties, and which is versatil uh, versatility, durability, high strength to weight ratio, and that has led to an exponential growth uh, in the past and also currently and in the future. Um, just in the last decade between 2010 and 2019, the global plastic production increased by almost 40% from 270 up to around about 370 million tons. Um, however, increasing production consequently results in higher amounts of plastics waste. That's clear. Um, just to take uh, the year 2018, here around about 250 million tons of plastic waste were generated worldwide. Um, only about 40 uh, million tons are recycled, um, which is around about 16-17%. Um, approximately the same amount is recovered as waste to energy, as we say, so incinerated to substitute uh, crude oil in generating heat and energy. And the rest, approximately two-thirds of the global plastics waste is not recovered. So we have an, really an upside potential here. Um, since the uh, Club of Rome, uh, the 70s, a major revolution in thinking in terms of circular economy and reuse of plastics can be observed. Um, together with um, carelessly discharged plastics, for example, packaging, construction materials, plastic waste enters the environment from year to year. And since plastic degrades slowly, its accumulation in, in, in water and in terrestrial ecosystem is definitely of increasing scientific and public concern. And you see here on the right uh, side of the slide, uh, the more or less exponential growth of the plastics and um, on the lower part, the amount of plastics being in, introduced into the sea by uh, the 10 major quote unquote rivers of that world. So it's definitely a concern and we need to tackle that. Um, one <clears throat> very frequently asked question is, are alternatives to plastics the solution? So as a consequence, do we need to phase out and avoid plastics in future? And if so, what are the materials that resubstitute the plastics? And together with that, are bioplastics the solution of the waste problem? Um, just allow me two citations um, in that respect. One from Professor Gerrit Luinstra, Chair of Technical Polymers at Hamburg University. He recently mentioned in an interview, unfortunately, it's often much easier to change materials rather than human behavior. Plastics are basically great materials. We should treat them as if they were gold. And let me say that just without any comment. With respect to human behavior, let me also cite um, a sentence which uh, Professor Kim Reichardt, um, now Maastricht University, uh, had in a recent TED talk. She explained it like that. Imagine someone parked a car in the middle of a highway. Who is to blame, the car or the idiot who left the car there? And obviously she's addressing uh, to, the, to, to the issue, are we really taking uh, care, diligent, uh, due diligence in order to do everything we can in order to establish a um, yeah, recycling system to make sure the circular economy uh, um, is, um, is, is built up and is, is, is um, realized. Um, 
and that I think is one of the key questions that uh, we need to answer. And uh, in the same uh, talk, Professor Kim Rechard uh, presented the, la the right slide. Uh, she compared the resources that you need in order to substitute plastics by other alternatives, glass, for example, or metals. And without going into details, you see here that uh, um, while doing, uh, while trying that, we would um, excessively use and overuse uh, the resources that Mother Earth provides to us, um, we would generate much more greenhouse gases so that um, this could not be the solution uh, that we envisage. The solution that we believe um, is a true solution is recycling of plastics. And not only of plastics, but we are talking about plastics today. And in the um, in the introduction of our uh, book, um, Virginia Janssens, the managing director of Plastics Europe, says it like that. Circularity is absolutely fundamental to our industry's transition. It's the most important medium term lever and recycling is an essential component of circularity. Plastics Europe and our members recognize this Systemic change is essential to achieve this and needs to be accelerated. European plastics manufacturers are already undertaking huge investments and a far-reaching reorganization of their production and technology base to increase circularity and support recycling. Now, um, while having said that, let me come back to us as Ineos Star Revolution. What are we doing? Um, as INEOS and as INEOS uh, Star Revolution um, to pave the way to a low carbon economy. And why you see here um, basically the whole set of measures along, uh, uh, along the, the value chain uh, from carbon offset, carbon capture, storage, uh, investments in assets, uh, fuel switching, feedstock switching. Um, allow me to uh, focus today on circularity and low carbon economy. And circularity means recycling, as the word says, recycling. And here we differentiate between mechanical and advanced recycling. <clears throat> Just to give you some example, what, um, what do we understand with uh, mechanical and uh, advanced recycling? Well, mechanical recycling, you all know, this is uh, typically when you uh, collect um, um, uh, waste, post-consumer waste, uh, you, you, you sort it, um, you purify it uh, eventually, and then you provide the post-consumer recycled um, to a new use, which sometimes could be a downcycling into less uh, preferential applications, but of course, uh, the target should always be to um, run that uh, process so well that you can reuse the materials in high quality applications to make really recycling a uh, recycling and not as, as we say, uh, 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 downcycling. So that's the most um, common um, uh, recycling method that we all know for many years. Um, um, due to um, several uh, participants, the dissolution became an interesting um, additional uh, recycling method in recent uh, years. And in dissolution, um, you take materials um, um, that you collect from post-consumer waste, you subject it to, a, as the name says, to a dissolution in the solvent. You re-precipitate it uh, with an anti-solvent, for example, and by that you purify it and the re-precipitated polymer can be reused uh, for high quality applications. Um, then the next one on that um, slide is depolymerization. It's a bit, um, how to say, a specialty of, of, of styrenics and especially polystyrene. So polystyrene is actually one of the few polymers that you can uh, uh, cleave back into its monomer. So if you heat up polystyrene to, let's say, 500 centigrades or above, then it goes back into the monomers, mainly into monomers with a few impurities. And that's very specific uh, for, 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 for polystyrene. 
There are other polymers, PMMA, PET, where you can uh, do that as well. And uh, other polymers, they disintegrate into rather less defined monomers. And uh, therefore, depolymerization is, um, is an effective way to uh, create monomers again from polymers. And these monomers, after purification, can be reused in the polymerization process um, to, uh, to yield uh, polymers. If you go up even higher in temperature, so above 600 grades, up to 8, 900, 1000 uh, centigrades, you end up with, um, you, you are doing pyrolysis uh, or gasification. And pyrolysis and gasification is important because uh, you might uh, want to use mixed waste, which otherwise cannot be you know, separated, delaminated, used for mechanical recycling or, or, or rather less preferential for depolymerization, then pyrolysis and gasification cleaves the molecules into very small molecules that can be fed back into the chemical infrastructure which exists and can be reused for chemicals, for plastics, for example, but also other chemicals. So it's, an, it's a way that makes use out of the otherwise difficult to recycle um, mixed plastics waste. So I think that is important. And the term advanced recycling, we, uh, uh, we, we, we say to all the polymer, uh, to all the recycling um, uh, tools beyond the mechanical recycling. Now, um, as I already mentioned, styrenics possess unequal recycling performance. And what, what uh, do we mean with that? Um, already in the collection, uh, phase, we see that uh, styrenics and here especially polystyrene uh, um, has very low contamination uptake. And I think that is, uh, that is very important to mention. Um, that means uh, what, you know, the so-called cats and dogs that don't go into the polystyrene don't have to be removed later on, right? The next step, the sorting step, we see that by state of the art uh, technologies like near infrared, um, it is very easy to detect and very clear to detect uh, polystyrene in waste streams. So it is uh, definitely possible to combine that with uh, sorting, uh, the detection with sorting technologies to phase out polystyrene from the other waste. Um, recycling, I just mentioned, basically all recycling methods can be applied. And um, <clears throat> our target is actually then by, by performing these first three steps uh, up to the state of the art that in the use phase of the post-consumer recycle it, we, we are aiming to achieve conventional quality levels. That means no downcycling. We really would like to, um, and we are aiming to, and I hope I can convince you today uh, to achieve um, levels of quality, of purity that allows, uh, for example, polystyrene to be reused in uh, food applications. And just by the way, just to mention um, uh, Ineos um, Styrolution uh, confirmed and, 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 and claims uh, um, to use so-called eco products, which are recycled or um, bioattributed products, to use uh, 500 kilotons uh, to produce, excuse me, 500 kilotons of eco products by 2030. So that will be a major pillar of our business. Um, going back to um, um, the uh, publication recycling of plastics, um, you might ask, okay, interesting. So polystyrene is uh, suitable for basically all the recycling methods. How now? How does um, polystyrene score with respect to CO2, which is our topic for today, in the different recycling methods? Um, um, do you do you see any difference? And uh, in a nutshell, we can say yes, there is a slight difference, but there is also an overarching scheme. So if you do the life cycle analysis according to ISO standards and define boundary conditions. Uh, mechanical recycling of polystyrene in comparison to dissolution recycling and in comparison to depolymerization. Um, then you see that um, um, the three 
um, uh, bars here, the, the, uh, the, the bar pairs consists of the uh, fossil based solution, which is uh, always the right higher bar and the recycling solution is the lower left bar. And while the um, CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions or CO2 equivalent emission um, is slightly different from recycling method to recycling method, it is clear that recycling as such provides a huge advantage to our, for our Mother Earth because the CO2 or greenhouse gas emissions are much lowered. Yeah, and I think that is the message. I don't want to go into into details, into detailed figures, but the message is uh, we can provide um, huge benefits with respect to CO2 by recycling. It's a common sense uh, message, but here is a, a clear um, Ceteris Palbus comparison in a life cycle analysis, which shows the data. Um, let me emphasize, and this is also one statement uh, in, in the book, that um, um, design for recycling is important to contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. And without going into all the details on, on that slide, let me just emphasize that uh, although there are no global rules for design for recycling established and not sure if and when that will come, uh, we all can pursue and, and follow guidelines that can help, for example, designers to improve the recyclability of their products. And let me just mention a few, uh, a few items. Um, um, prefer materials that can be easily recycled. I think that is, uh, that, is, that is clear. Reduce or avoid materials that are difficult to recycle. That's the other side of the medal. Um, reduce or minimize the variety of materials uh, during the development phase. If that is possible, um, it's uh, clear to say that there are high quality and, and high performing uh, multi-material solutions out there, um, uh, which would be practically impossible to change. And here we have recycling methods like, uh, uh, like gasification uh, or pyrolysis. But wherever mono material is possible, let's try to do that. Yeah, and uh, um, that is uh, one uh, um, recommendation for design of uh, for recycling. Also, a design for disassembly is important. Um, a labeling of uh, the products is important, and also and that is uh, that goes to us as uh, producers. Um, consider amount, type, and use of additives. That means. Um, um, additives which always have the function to provide can, you know, can vary and um, um, already today, but even more in future, one important and um, maybe maybe even dominating criteria would be uh, do additives contribute to recyclability? So not only to to the typical things like improved flow, heat or UV resistance. Yes, that's of course important, that's essential, but uh, the question is, um, can we, by, by uh, using the right additives, can we contribute for a better recycling behavior of the final product? Um, let me emphasize one thing that uh, I mentioned in one sentence uh, before uh, under eco products. So we have uh, basically uh, shown um, in, in, in the last slides that recycling is, uh, is an effective tool to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there is an, another basically independent tool to effectively reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and that is the use of biofeedstock. And um, this uh, slide shows you basically two routes. Um, uh, the lower one, it's an enzymatic and or chemical conversion of biofeedstock into, into building blocks, which can be used then for building the polymers. Um, the upper one is uh, the use of so-called bio-NAFTA. Um, NAFTA is, uh, so to say, the lifeblood of the, of the industry. Um, downstream of NAFTA, you have um, you have crackers, you have conversion of uh, of that material into into building blocks, into organic chemicals, and uh, 
although there is not sufficient bio nafta to, to fill, for example, steam crackers completely, there is um, bio nafta available that can be then allocated by a certified allocation method uh, to create biomolecules, which then are again allocated to the resulting products like the polymers. Um, and uh, here is <clears throat> an example which I want to show you um, uh, from our company uh, that uh, shows carbon emissions down by that bioattributed uh, material. And uh, the examples I would like to share with you is uh, Starolux Eco and Styroflex Eco, uh, both 100% bioattributed uh, with a neutral or even negative carbon footprint. Uh, products targeted for packaging and flooring. Uh, first packaging customers are on board. And um, um, we would like to share with you um, the details of that um, of, of, of that. Um, yeah, of that route. Um, as I mentioned before, um, worldwide there is not sufficient bio nafta available to create in in the big plants um, um, bio um, a, a complete downstream um, product line based on biomolecules so allocation is very important um, um, but it's a certified process which clearly allocates only those uh, biomolecules to products which are uh, which which yeah, were found in the or, or were added in, in, in the starting feed. And uh, you see here um, two bars. Um, on the left, uh, you see um, emissions, uh, CO2 equivalents from fossil based material. And on the right, you see emissions based on bio attributed material. And you see that this bio attribution um, on average reduces the CO2 equivalent by 100% between 85 and 126%. So that is a very effective way um, to come to a carbon neutral economy, circular economy, low carbon economy. And why having said that, um, if you're interested, please uh, uh, browse in the in, in, in the in the book, we have um, uh, collected um, uh, co-authors, specialists in this field uh, along the whole value chain from universities uh, over recyclers and uh, and and producers, and um, all the specialists um, uh, contribute to uh, share their view on recycling of plastics in the very in, in their very step uh, of the of the value chain. So I think you might find that interesting. And why having said that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, would like to invite you for a Q&A session. So any question, please let me know. All right. Here is. Um, <clears throat> I think I can go back into into this one. Right here is one uh, one question. Uh, can you explain in more detail what makes styrenic polymers so exceptionally uh, exceptionally suitable for recycling, especially for mechanical recycling into food quality material? Right, I'm happy happy to do so. Um, so styrenic polymers, for example, polystyrene occur in a in a glassy stage. That means polystyrene has a glass so called glass transition temperature of about 90 to 100 centigrades. That means at use temperature, room temperature, 30, 40 centigrades, um, um, all the impurities that might be in the post consumer recycled material are entrapped. Yeah, so they uh, their migration is hindered because of this glassy stage and that is important. That means migration barrier is one one key element uh, when using polystyrene uh, post consumer polystyrene for that purpose. On the other hand, <clears throat> I mean, you all have um, 
have in mind the the spectrum of use of polystyrene. It's typically dairy product packaging. Um, and here you have cream with cream yogurt and things like that. And what we observe is that um, really the uptake of polystyrene of um, let's say these materials that can lead to impurities is very low. Yeah? So we have a combination actually of very low uptake of foreign materials or cats and dogs impurities combined with a, let's say migration barrier or migration hindrance uh, at use temperature. And that really makes uh, especially polystyrene uh, very suitable and from our point of view, the material for uh, post-consumer recycling. Right. Um, another question is, uh, why does polystyrene score excellent in chemical recycling? Yes, happy to, to answer that. Um, so <clears throat> let me become a bit technical. Um, so polymers have a so-called uh, ceiling temperature. That means at that uh, temperature, polymer decomposes. And polystyrene ceiling temperature is, is in, an, in an area where polystyrene decomposes preferentially into, into styrene and not into undefined byproducts like, let's say, many, many other polymers. And, and, and that is in, that is kind of a new UVP that polystyrene shares with PMMA. As I mentioned in my talk, also PET can be cleaved, but hydrolytically uh, into, in, into, into monomers by chemical recycling, so also behaves uh, very, very benign. And, um, and this uh, ceiling temperature actually is, um, is, is the reason why polystyrene scores so well. That means um, you create uh, preferentially styrene, plus some byproducts which have to be removed by purification methods like distillation. And uh, then the styrene can be subjected to polymerization in the production. All right. Um, there's another question. Um, don't polymers like polystyrene or ABS lose molecular weight after post-consumer recycling and doesn't that lead to a tremendous downcycling? Um, yeah, indeed, there are polymers that lose molecular weight um, 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 when subjected to, um, to, to thermal treatment, um, to, to heat, to temperature. Um, what we what we saw in in polystyrene and ABS is that uh, there is um, no detectable change in molecular weight. That means um, uh, molecular weight, which is, you know, the, and sorry to be to be that technical here, which uh, uh, which, which is the reason for 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 mechanical properties, for in integrity of the product and the um, stiffness toughness balance and so on. Um, that is um, that is uh, that is not influenced, and um, um, in in recycling, and therefore I would say that is another unique value of of polystyrene and ABS uh, for the use of uh, um, for, for for the use in in post consumer recycling. Yeah, there is another one I see here. Um, um, when discussing recycling of polystyrene, is also the copolymers ABS SAN ASA considered and the impact modified uh, like HIPS? Yes, in basically, yes, there is just one difference, and thanks for that question. There is just one difference uh, because, um, as I mentioned, the depolymerization recycling is kind of restricted to polystyrene. So many other polymers, also ABS and, and, and SAN and ASA, can cannot be recycled um, in, in, in the depolymerization scheme, but uh, they can be recycled in pyrolysis and gasification. Yeah, so there is 
there is a difference, but there is a commonality as well, like mechanical recycling, um, as we uh, have shown in our eco products, uh, we can create high quality uh, eco post consumer recycled products uh, based on polystyrene as well as on ABS, for example. Right. Um, I have to check with my colleague Katya. I think we are in the moment uh, at the do I, do I have a bit more time? Then um, I can oh, answer. Of course. Yeah. Um, here, is, um, here is one question. Can you please explain a bit more about the negative CO2 emissions you give for the bioattributed grades? What assumptions are you making to get uh, negative values. Yes, this uh, question we had discussed on our uh, booth at the uh, K2022 fair in Düsseldorf. Um, it is it, it comes with a with, with a with with a credit that you get when you work with uh, with with biomaterials, right? Um, so it's an again it's a it's a certified process uh, made by certified independent institutes that calculate the CO2 emissions. And as you work with a with a huge backpack, so to say, of cred of CO2 credit carried by the biomolecules, then it is clear that um, the um, you you basically end up with roundabout neutral CO2 emissions when using 100% bio-based molecules. In essence, it's an it's a variation between 80 and 100. 20 something as you have seen, um, but uh, that is uh, due to the due to the let's say load positive load uh, that you carry uh, from from uh, natural products which um, during their lifetime have absorbed CO2 uh, from the atmosphere. Here is one uh, one question. Are there already clear studies proving the chemical recycling of styrenics is sustainable also on the carbon footprint? Um, yeah, as I uh, as I mentioned uh, in one of my slides, um, this study, um, this study was made and is, is also published. Um, um, there are other studies um, which um, uh, which which are available and uh, please um, um, I think the question comes from from Alan. Uh, please <clears throat> approach me. We have um, we have literature here as well, which we I think hopefully also from copyright reasons we can share. Uh, also other institutes have investigated uh, like the University of Ghent investigated chemical recycling, especially of styrenics. So that would answer your question. Um, in, in, a, in, a, in a life cycle analysis, and they come basically to the same results that I presented um, uh, in my in my talk. Right. Um, here is another anonymous question: When you include biogenic carbon coming from renewable resources? Do such bioattributed products have higher or lower uh, greenhouse gas than mechanical recycled styrenics? Well, I think um, uh, let me emphasize that we have actually two more or less independent routes here, which I tried to present in my slide deck. The one is recycling. I think uh, recycling from a CO2 emission point of view, but also from a, I would say from a from a responsibility point of view, is a must. So we, we strongly believe in that uh, as, as good corporate citizens, I think it is a uh, it is a must that we aim to do everything to make the, 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 the loop closed. Um, and with that closing that loop, you have seen in, in the slides that this comes with a significantly reduced CO2 uh, emission. Independently of that, of course, you can even re recycle material that has started with biogenic carbon even better. Yeah, and um, I've, I've just a minute ago discussed about this um, 
bioattribution process. So you have two effective tools um, that uh, um, significantly reduce um, the uh, CO2 or the greenhouse gas emission. Yeah, and let me emphasize again: they are more or less independently of each uh, uh, of each other. So it's not the choice: can we use either the one or the other? But um, if possible and if available, of course, we can uh, use bioattributed material. And then, of course, uh, uh, the recommendation would be definitely to recycle it and not fall back into a linear economy. Um, here is uh, one question, and I would I would say let's stop after that. How much CO2 emission can be uh, saved at ABS? 80%. Um, this is an uh, yeah an anonymous question. I would also say please approach uh, me as well. Um, we have some data on uh, CO2 on life cycle analysis of of ABS. Um, all performed according to the ISO standards, and uh, yeah, I would be happy to share uh, to share the results uh, with you. But I think this requires a bit more intensive discussion. Um, here is. Yeah, one I think one last question I see here from Alan. How do you see the PPWD trend for the styrenics? Is there's a clear focus on post consumer plastics, uh, but the food contact is uh, is still a limit on top of the feedstock availability. Um, yeah, um, that is. Um, 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 that is a challenge. Food is the high food quality is the highest possible quality that you can achieve in mechanical recycling. And I'm really proud to say that um, with this unique value proposition set that we all knew polystyrene has, but we rediscovered that in the recent four, five, or six years, once we intensified our activities, we really see that it is possible yeah, to. Uh, with the right sorting, with the right purification, um, and with the right material, which is polystyrene, to achieve uh, food quality. That is possible. It's um, 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 it, it's not a given, um, but um, but for polystyrene, we we have we have seen that this um, let's say beneficial set of properties contributes to establish or to re-establish polystyrene as the material for recycling. All right, I think we have come to an end. Um, is if there is no more no more question, then uh, let me just ask my, my 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 colleague Katya. Is there anything for me now to to announce? Anything else we need to? To you do just to wrap up. Show the last uh, slide. Yes, let me. Let me do that. Yeah. Can you can you see the last slide? All fine. All right. So here you see uh, the contact. So don't hesitate contacting um, me or, uh, or my colleagues. Happy to um, to answer your questions that you might have as good as I can. Um, you see my email address or the webinar address of Ineos Star Illusion. More information you will get on our homepage. Um, also under the Star Illusion. Uh, Echo uh, address. You can get a lot of uh, helpful information. Yeah, let me say I'm uh, happy I had the opportunity to share with you the insights on uh, on CO2 reduction um, in 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 styrenix plastics. And uh, yeah, hope to stay in contact with you. And again, 
don't hesitate contacting me and uh, yeah, all the best. Have a great Friday and hopefully see you soon. Thank you very much. Driving success together.